Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to lunch. Um, it's a pleasure again to be up here presenting uh, to you guys this afternoon. And um, really, the theme, the theme of, the, of the day now, as we get into the work stream updates, is to really talk about the progress that we've made and also to take advantage of the fact that there are some fresh faces here and to get some dates and perspectives on what we've done and where we want to go. And that's kind of the thing that I wanted to share with the, the leadership engagement update. When we started the leadership engagement update, we were talking about how to engage the CEO suite around getting their insights and getting their input as to how would they bring their culture and quality. And as I mentioned earlier this morning, as we started talking about the case of quality, one of the areas that we all had agreed on was how important the culture was going to be and how important it was going to have it was going to be to have the buy-in from the C-suite. And I know that through personal experience and working with others that have had similar experience, that's a big deal. Having a CEO, having the leadership, having business unit uh, leadership, having those conversations about culture quality or quality culture throughout the organization and all levels of the organization is really paramount in the success that I think we're seeing in just the appraisal as well, because it all starts from the top and it starts, you know, that conversation top down, bottom up, having that conversation about how important the culture is. So the leadership engagement idea, uh, program was established to really do an outreach and a survey of the leading CEOs in the, within the MDIC network, within the AdvoMed network, to kind of just gauge where we were. So I'll share with you some of the results that we collected in our survey, and then talk a little bit about some next steps. But before I do that, I do want to recognize and acknowledge the folks that are on the team. Uh, again, this is a volunteer group, and we all have our full-time jobs. Some of our jobs are expanding, and uh, and so it's, it's really, it's, it's really a testament to them and their dedication and passion for what we're doing. And I think anybody that's running the work stream or the work group can say the same thing about their teams and the dedication that their team members are, are making in the progress that, we, that we've seen. But clearly, the progress that this entire initiative is making couldn't be where it is without volunteers and folks in this list. So I certainly want to thank them uh, for their participation and their ongoing efforts. And really, as I mentioned earlier, some really creative ideas and suggestions. And there's a lot of very smart people uh, involved in this program. And uh, sometimes, I was telling Jason, sometimes I feel like I'm not the smartest person in the room that I claim to be. But man, I'll tell you, when I'm in the room with this group, I really feel like I'm uh, playing catch up. So I really do acknowledge the fact that you guys are just brilliant in what we do. So in terms of the program timeline, you know, we started this in, in September. We had officially chartered the program back in the April 18 timeframe coming out of our steering committee meeting with the, with the uh, steering committee group. And we did a strategy plan with the, with the agency in uh, White Oaks, the White Oaks campus. Um, so we've been making really good progress. And I will tell you that as you start to see where we are, uh, we are a little bit stalled now because now the real work starts. It's like, what's next? The survey. A lot of questions, you know, we've debated on what type of questions. Uh, folks that have had already done surveys in the past were very helpful in developing that survey. Now that the, the data is, is in, it's interpreting, interpreting that data and then talking about the next steps. And I think that's where we're real, a little slowed down on, on should it be a pilot, should it be a playbook, what does that look like? So those are the things that we're talking about now. But the, the basis of the survey, so we had 103 responses and of that 103, 88 actually completed the entire survey. And when we started this, I think members of the team thought 50 responses would be really good. And we got 103. So it was, we were pretty impressed with the, with the participation. And you'll also see the level of participation we get, you know, where the executive leadership and then the business unit leadership, which is where we targeted this, we got, we got a bulk of, you know, we got the majority of our responses. And then if you look at the regions, a bit spread in terms of what regions they represent or participate in. So we talked about um, things like the leadership proactively promotes quality, you know, promotes quality across 
activities and functions. Uh, we set expectations for people and we, and we make it part of their performance. And performance is driving, it's, over, it's not cost driven, it's performance and quality driven. Um, so you'll see that a lot of the answers that we, we saw were really strong positive responses. Now one of the first things that I do with the survey is I look for the neutrals. I view that where, where are the neutrals and why are we, you know, why are they, why are they neutral? Could that be potentially a agree or could that be a potential disagree? And what, what kind of work do we have to do there? But you'll see that um, when we start talking about expectations that people prioritize high quality performance over cost, there's pretty strong neutral there. And I think that is an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that at the team level. When you talk about, I regularly encourage people to understand how quality fits in their job. You know, this is that top-down, bottom-up conversation. And that's an important message that they are delivering. And then tying certain quality targets to their performance. You'll see a lot, a lot of folks are tying quality initiatives and incentives to their performance. I will say that um, when you're talking about the results of this survey, there were, a, there were some surprises, and then there were very few surprises. Uh, there were certain things in terms of what I expected to hear and see, we did see. Um, but then when you start talking about some of the things later on in the, in, in the survey, you'll see that I was a little surprised that, that um, we got the answers that we did. And part of it is, is this behavior piece. You know, you can, there's, while there's a strong desire and a strong emphasis on recognizing behaviors, there is that neutral piece that to me says, well, what's going on there? What buyers is not do that, you know, you're tying behaviors to quality outcomes. And having some personal experience around that, um, when I look at Prakash and Catherine and Jackie, who we share a lot of commonality around the culture of quality, you know, it, the behaviors are really the, the things that drive the outcomes. And that top down, bottom up, demonstrating behaviors, talking about those behaviors, that's really the, an opportunity that I see we could, we could leverage and be better at. And then when we talk about it, my company, we have well defined, effectively communicated quality strategy. You know, this is this, the timing of this one was good for me because we were in the middle of our strat planning period. So it was nice to see that a lot of companies do have. Um, well-defined quality strategies. Um, the next thing is how well are they communicating, right? That's the next piece. Um, at a company, people focus more on preventing issues. Here's an opportunity. If you look at the neutrals who disagree and strongly disagree, you know, we have an opportunity to be more preventive. And how do we leverage things like the CAPA program, things like quality as a career, things like the maturity model, to be able to drive more prevention, right, versus reactive. And then when we look at formally measured cost of quality, this is where the team really identified the opportunities. Um, because as some of us have already had conversations about, when you have a culture of quality, all things should come, should pull through. There's correlations to Demonstrating proper behaviors, demonstrating proper results, and tying correlations to you know, performance and saving costs and improving the cost of quality, reducing the cost of poor quality, because it should all pull through. So where we are as a team right now is, do we focus on an opportunity to talk about the value of quality or do we talk about expanding the opportunities to build a stronger culture of quality through all aspects of the culture? Again, tying behaviors and performance and recognition and communication and awareness, patient awareness. You know, we touch the product, we touch the patient. And will that naturally pull through the correlation that costs will get better, costs will come down, defects rate, rates will come down. And so it'll naturally progress to a much more cost effective quality system. Yeah, Lewis. Yes, uh, we, we actually, it's one of the companies that have implemented cost of quality measurement. So it's appraisal cost, retention cost, and failure cost. And I, my position is that if you don't measure it, it won't get done. Mm -hmm. But also, <laughs> the more important thing is the conversation about the activity-based accounting will get people aware what they're doing really is no value. 
and therefore get them start the mindset of the game. Okay, great, thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? <coughs> So where we are today as a team is the, the development of that playbook, talking about what areas of the greatest need and greatest focus. So you're measuring the cost or value of quality, uh, understanding the link between behaviors and outcomes, and then move from a reactive to a proactive mindset. And the, the where, where we are today is there's sort of a, I don't want to say debate, but there's lively discussion around, is it a, is it a playbook approach and all things, you know, being equal, the tide raising of the tide floats all boats, or is it a directive on value of quality? And um, so during today's breakout, those of you who want to participate in the leadership engagement, those are some of the things we want to talk about. To sort of distill down into the into the um, updates and the survey results, and just hear your feedback, because when you when you look at what we were trying to do, it was the entire culture, and if there's opportunities to improve awareness, if there's opportunities to improve recognition and behaviors, does that, does that naturally pull everything else together? There are some examples, there's some independent studies that show you know, if you make progress in your culture, there's direct correlation to improve defect rates, a reduction of complaints, reduction of cost, and in some cases, it's substantial. So if you're moving the needle slightly, What's the, what's the cost implications of that? So those are the kinds of things that we're talking about because the idea is that we want to give a playbook very similar to the Library of Successful Practices. We want to give <laughs> folks an opportunity to take a look at how other companies are doing this. And if you're on a path and you're looking to improve, here are some ways to do it. If you're on a path of, of exploration and this is something that you're trying to implement, here are ways companies can implement it. So you can pick and choose, you can take parts of, of everybody's best practices and create a program for yourself, or you can change and steal somebody else's program and, and copy it. Um, it's out there, right? Because you know it works. There's, there's, there's a lot of evidence out there that, that it works. So there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, I want to use the playbook that was developed by this other company. Because that, that's why we did that. That's why we created the Library of Successful Practices. So companies can use that tool in their toolbox. Who's here to comment? Actually, there are studies done. Uh, ISP uh, ASQ has done work on the cost quality. In fact, they said that if you have a improved culture quality, sixty million dollars per five thousand people, employees. So if you, you know, so so that's the that's a dollar value that, that you can you can get. So you have two thousand twenty thousand people. You got a lot of money. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's exactly right. So as we, as we talk about, uh, we're looking for volunteers for today's discussion uh, around these principles um, so that we can take it back to the team and really just talk about what, what are some of the next steps. But ideally, we want to implement the pilot, implement the playbook, uh, and making it meaningful. And then there's discussion about going out and resurveying eventually to see how effective those tools have been for those companies. Any questions? Uh, so I got a question for CMMI team. Uh, uh, within the CMMI model, how do you assess quality culture, people engagement, those kind of stuff? <laughs> so currently within the, uh, the baseline, the reappraisals, uh, the direct answer is that um, there's two practice areas that are lending to that. And Ken mentioned one of them in our presentation called implementation infrastructure, which is related to that persistence of habit of any particular processes, and that is attributable to culture. And there's also a governance um, practice area, which is about the leadership of the organization. Um, so, you know, note to myself here as Joe was talking about this, like, I've not necessarily kept tabs on this working group, but I think just you know, some, at least a conversation between. You and I are Kim and you uh, as to what practice areas, what practices are within that practice area, and like what things overlap with it. <clears throat> maybe something comes out of it. So, um, I wouldn't say that's a holistic uh, assessment of the culture um, uh, of, of an organization. Um, there's other um, 
there's there's a peep with CM, CMM uh, as well. Um, and there's, there's been this kind of back, uh, back going conversation as to how we could further assess culture. Um, but we also made decisions as to keep the practice, like we're also assessing things related to design and manufacturing as well. So um, culture is actually assessed in all of that to some degree. But I would say those are the, the two most direct practice areas to address it. So George, I think that's important that we can touch base on it because I think one of the lessons learned that you've got uh, on the second appraisal is you know, some of that feedback that can be shared around the value of the awareness that quality has and the impact that it has. And I think that's directly proportional to the, the impact that the culture has, right? So the more awareness, I think you've, you've heard a number of people talk about how you create that awareness and the value of that culture gets unlocked almost immediately. You know, when, the, when a person realizes the role that they play in a finished good, you know, we, we've all talked about it, you know, it's important to realize that that device <clears throat> might be used on someone on you or someone sitting next to you or a loved one, right? And we all probably have examples where that's happened in our lives. And a lot of times, whether you're talking to a supplier or you're talking to a frontline employee, they may not have made that connection. But the minute you make that product awareness connection, the value of your culture is unlocked. I mean, it's almost, you, you can't stop the momentum that that creates in some cases, which you don't want to stop that because that, the challenge then becomes, and I think a lot of folks have heard me say this, the challenge becomes that middle manager level who is struggling with, do I shut the line down or do I continue to meet the production rates that I'm kind of committed to? And so the top down, bottom up conversation has to, un, has to be able to give those people and empower them to be able to say it's okay to shut the line down for a quality issue you know, over cost of production. And once those, start, those things start to happen, I think for Kosh and Catherine, Jackie, you guys have all seen it. I mean, yeah. we all have similar CEOs that we all work for or work with now that have been able to deliver that positive message. So again, yeah, that's that's the value that I think we, we, could, we can unlock in what practice areas. Yeah, is that, is I, I, I would also add to just on that, I mean, like another thing that we do, um, another thing that we do actually is with, with any participants in, in an appraisal, there's a, this is, this is so simple, it's, it's, I'm almost embarrassed to admit it, but we, we have a, an anonymous survey with every appraisal with all the, the participants. We call it the two question survey. And it's your classic kind of anchors and sales sort of survey. Like if you were to restart this organization from scratch, what practices would you um, bring with you? Um, and which ones would you um, absolutely leave behind? And so that's done um, adjacent to our appraisal activities. And we just take those results and we feed those back to the organization, um, pretty much in their raw form. You know, sometimes we have to maybe eliminate some salty language, but um, <laughs> but we, we that there alone is it also provides an insight back to the uh, the organization, the appraisal sponsor, the folks that were a part of the appraisal, in a very profound and powerful way about culture. Right, you're directly hearing from those people, and, and again, it's it's really simple to ask those questions, right? But maybe they've never done it before, so. All right, any other comments or questions? All right.